And from fantasy to science fiction now. Not to be confused unless we want a very full inbox from Gandalf disciples not already outraged by Mal's satirising. A futuristic new experiment sets out to discover what happens when you mix writers and scientists in a creative laboratory. Comma Press has teamed up experts in artificial life with wordsmiths like Frank Cottrell Boyce and Toby Litt, and the result, Beta Life, is a diverse collection of short stories all set in 2070. The book was edited by Martin Amos of Manchester Metropolitan University, who joins me now down the line from Salford, along with Sarah Schofield, who worked with Martin on her story, Bacto Garden. Martin, uh, what is it about artificial life or a life, as I believe it's now called, that you felt would be fertile territory for, for novelists to explore? Well, like many research areas, um, a life is inherently speculative. So I think it naturally lends itself to fiction. We can we can trace the connection between a life and fiction all the way back to to Frankenstein. And Theodore Sturgeon published a story as early as 1941 that that dealt explicitly with the notion of uh, synthetic life, and it's also very diverse in in terms of the the topics it covers. It requires input from biologists and chemists and mathematicians and computer scientists. So um, there's a lot of scope there for exploration in terms of in terms of narrative. Nineteen different writers, nineteen different stories in the collection. Did you find, Martin, when you came to edit them, that they had much in common beyond being set in 2070? What's your sense of the collection as a whole? Well, we were very keen at the outset to avoid um, the stories being dominated by the technology. We didn't want them to be very sort of boisy and 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 all about laser guns and and flying cars. Well, so I quite like one of those. <laughs> But uh, as co-editor, I, I, I was pleased when the, when the drafts started coming in to see that the technology wasn't front and centre. They dealt primarily with, with the human dimensions of, of A-Life, the, the implications for A-Life on society. And Sarah's story was, was a beautiful uh, example of that because the backdrop to the story is synthetic biology, this idea that we can engineer living cells to to persuade them to do anything we want, making high-end food products and, and, and fixing cracks in, in buildings and so on. But primarily, the main driver behind the story was very human issues of, of beauty and, and control. Sarah, your story, Back to Garden, um, with, with your story, Back to Garden, technology is right at the centre of a very ordinary and these days enormously popular activity, eating. It's about a, a futuristic chef, Stevie, a kind of extreme version of Heston Blumenthal. Let's hear a selection from the menu. Douglas lays a plate before her. Reader's Digest. For this dish, Stevie has created germinated shoots, a delicate wagyu-inspired synth carpaccio, and caviar containing the complete works of Shakespeare. Douglas pours her water. She waits for him to leave before scooping a few spheres of the golden caviar onto her fork. She bursts them against the roof of her mouth. It is hot and sweet, horseradish and beetroot. Course follows indulgent course. Edible oyster pearls. Dodo soup for the soul. Probiotic candy floss melts to syrup on her tongue, tasting of tomato, basil and mozzarella. She picks at her food, her stomach gurgling, sweat beading her forehead. Sarah, it's a story of haves and have-nots. At the centre is the ludicrously luxurious and indulgent restaurant, a world where anything is possible, right down to a spider being genetically altered to spin blue nectarine-scented edible thread for a special garment, not even oligarchal, that way beyond. Uh, but there are also climate refugees living in poverty. What, what was your purpose in drawing these extreme contrasts, aside from the, the sad reminder that class war will still be with us? Mm. That was very much something that I was exploring through this story and I don't know whether I have come to any great conclusions about that. I think there's something important to think about that within advanced technology, advancing technology, it will be ubiquitous. So this particular area that I was looking at, which is in bio, synthetic biology, as a case in point, it will be used for social good 
uh, the character Kay is a construction worker and she uses the this, this synthetic biology to fix buildings. But then also Stevie with her frivolous fads of the food, uh, it's pure luxury, pure indulgence. And I think I wanted to look at these two contrasting ideas, but I didn't want to come down morally on one side or the other. I really just wanted to explore that and I hope that the reader is able to make their own judgments on that and make their own decisions about whereabouts on that on that scale they put themselves. This theme of rich and poor is a, uh, is prevalent in other stories, isn't it, Martin? Julian Goff and Robin Yes and Kassa both have stories in which money can buy access to artificial life developments that the poor can't have. It's, it's a rather depressing prediction. It is depressing in the sense that in, in some, some of the stories the technology is being used to, to actively put down populations. But I guess just to echo Sarah's point, really, we're trying to emphasise that in, in 2070 this, this, this technology will just become part of the infrastructure of, of, of life. And nobody writes stories about mobile telephones anymore, but I'm <laughs> sure 20 years ago it would have been perfectly reasonable to to imagine a, a dystopian future in which only the haves have access to this sort of communication technology. Sarah, um, working with uh, Martin, he was your pair on this story. How did, how did that actually unfold? How did, you, how did you do it? The writers are all given a list of topics. You uh, go through the list, decide which ones your, most, your interest is most piqued on, uh, where you feel you can go with the various ideas that, that are put forward. And then once you've uh, chosen your idea you're then partnered with your consultant scientist and we we just met for lunch and chatted over lots and lots of different ideas and just took the conversation wherever we felt it wanted to go and from that we started to to put ideas together and it's been a very collaborative process it's been a really um, enjoyable process and right throughout the whole um, writing journey it's uh, it's been making sure that all the science in it is is correct and uh, and legitimate yeah the process actually very closely mirrored that of writing a scientific paper and that we we started off with a few germs of ideas uh, and then gradually refined them over you know much coffee and, and food mm. uh, and and sort of just just <laughs> open-ended conversation Martin, it's easy to understand what Sarah took from you. It's your scientific expertise that underpins the story, of course, but what did you learn from her? I always wanted to be a writer before I got my first computer. <laughs> when I was about 12 or 13, I always thought I wanted to be a novelist. And actually working with, with Sarah has been quite a joy because it's, it's allowed me to, um, by proxy, sort of allow the, the novelist or the writer in me to, to, to contribute to, to a piece of fiction. I think having to explain your own work um, to an intelligent layperson is very valuable in terms of uh, clarifying in your own head as a scientist what it is you're trying to achieve why do you get out of bed every morning what's the scientific underpinning of what you do and at the end of the day why does it matter why should anyone really care about your research and if you can't write a good short story about what you're doing then i i would wonder well is what you're doing really relevant martin amos and sarah schofield thank you very much and beta life is published by comma press